Very good afternoon, one and all. I'm Kamle Kalman, a PharmD student uh, from Nirmala College of Pharmacy, Muatubura. With immense pleasure, I welcome you all to this webinar. We all know that National Science Day has been celebrated every year on 28th of February. So this day is marked as an honor for Sir C. B. Raman, our India's first scientist who won the Nobel Prize. In 1986, the National Council of Science and Technology, Government of India proposed that this very day should be celebrated as a National Science Day. The objective of this day is to inculcate and promote the science and scientific thinking among the young researchers. So today we are aiming to foster the inquisitiveness and the research mindset among the pharmacy students. So this year's theme is global science for global well-being. Today, we are having many pharmacists and pharmacy students for this webinar. We know that science is related to pharmacy. A focus on healthcare requires a high degree of scientific knowledge so that they can transform the global health. In order to do that, the pharmacy community is striving to mold and launch quality and affordable medicines and medical devices in the market. So we need more and more young researchers from the pharmacy community in the future from our country to witness the new innovation that must be useful for the society. So today, IPA Kerala State Branch is providing us that opportunity to be a part of this webinar. The Indian Pharmaceutical Association, IPA, founded in 1939, is the oldest premier association of pharmaceutical professionals in India. With a member base of over 20,000 spread across the length and breadth of the nation. The members represent various facets of the pharmaceutical profession, like from industry, regulatory, community and hospital practices and education. As the member of Drug Technical Advisory Board India, IPA is actively involved in advising the government on matters of professional importance. IPA is affiliated with international pharma associations like FIP and is working with international bodies such as WHO for carrying out various collaborative professional activities for the professionals from industry, academics, regulatory, and practice. IPA's major objective is to position the pharmacists as one of the important healthcare providers in our country. So I cordially invite you all to this webinar organized by the Education Division of IPA Kerala State Branch. So, Let's begin our session by seeking the blessings of God Almighty. Kavila, what happened? Don't live up with the Lord in the light of His word. What a glory He sheds on our way. While we do His good work, He abides with us still. 
and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in God but to trust and obey. No to shadow can rise, no to cloud in the skies, but the smile quickly drives it away. No to doubt or a fear, no to sigh or a tear, can a bird smile be dressed and obey? Dressed and obey, for there's no other way. To be happy in God, but to trust and obey, but to trust and obey, but to trust and obey. So, next, I would like to invite Dr. John Joseph, sir, Honorable Secretary. IPA Kerala State Branch. He is also the principal of Lizzie College of Pharmacy, Kochi. So I invite him to deliver the welcome address. Sir, please. Thank you, Camilla. Hope I am audible. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Respected dignitaries, and my dear fellow pharmacists, and my dear students. Today and every year on 28th of February, we celebrate the National Science Day. Every year we have this since 1986. There's a purpose behind this. It's to share the valuable knowledge from eminent scientists and to boost the young budding scientists and to inculcate a curiosity, a research mind in our students. As already mentioned, the theme for this year is global science for global well-being. We pharmacists cannot stand away from well-being because we are a big part. We have a big part to play in the well-being of human beings. We should remember the human services rendered by the pharmacists during the pandemic, COVID pandemic in the last few years. And hereafter also, our contribution as scientists, pharmaceutical scientists in global well-being is to be much more than what we have done earlier. And today, I'm very happy that two great scientists are with us to enlighten us. Professor Padmasri Padmanabhan Balram, who is an eminent scientist. He was heading the prestigious Indian Institute of Sciences, Bangalore. He'll be delivering the keynote address and also inaugurating today's functions. So on behalf of all gathered here, I extend a warm welcome to Professor Padmanabhan, sir. And our guest of honor today is Dr. Ajay Damodaran Pillai, himself another scientist. And he's going to guide us, all the budding pharmacists, the students, to make a career in science. Our sciences, pharmaceutical sciences, I'm sure after listening to him, we'll be able to get more ideas how to make a career in our lives. Coming to the young scientists today, we have two of them, Dr. Chandran R, who is from very humble beginnings, has reached the zenith. I would say at this younger age, he has acquired a PhD from one of the prestigious institutions. We welcome you, sir, and your words will be a real motivation to all the students and the budding pharmacists. I also have great privilege and pride in welcoming 
another young scientist, Dr. Vrinda S. Kumar, who also happens to be my student. I'm really proud that she's here today and her words will, of wisdom will enlighten you. I should also welcome the team of IPA Kerala State Branch, headed by President Dr. Jay Shagar Sar, who sleepless, spends sleepless nights in motivating the pharmacy profession and the uplift of the pharmacy profession. Welcome you, sir, Dr. Jay Shagar. The chairman of the Education Forum, Dr. Kray Krishna Kumar, another great organizer and motivator. Thank you for being with us and welcome you, Dr. Krishna Kumar. We have many eminent personalities, two of them chairing the sessions, Dr. Mohammed Hanifa, principal of Maulana College and also the president of the APTI. Dr. Sabida M, principal of Amrita School of Pharmacy, Kochi. Dr. Arun Rachid, a senior faculty member, Dr. Akash, a lot of eminent personalities, members of the IPA, members of the IPA team who makes the events more colorful and energetic. Welcome you all. And above all, let me welcome all the great, all the budding students, budding pharmacists to this great occasion. I hope after today's deliberances and listening to the eminent personalities, you'll all be motivated to become greater scientists in future. Wishing you all every best. Thank you. Thank you, John, sir. Now, I would like to invite Dr. P. J. Shigar, sir, President, IPA Kerala State Branch, former Dean, College of Pharmacy, National University of Science and Technology, Muscat. I welcome him for the presidential address. Sir, please. Thank you, Camilla. Good afternoon to all and all. Warm greetings on the occasion of our National Science Day. Chief Guest of the Inaugural Ceremony, Padma Bhushan Sri P. Balram sir, former director of IAC, distinguished speaker Ajay Damodaran, a scientist in National Center for Cell Science, Pune, and our young scientists who passed out PhD from a NIPER, Dr. Chandan, as well as Dr. Brinda Kumar, who got a PhD from Amuda Institute. Our honorary secretary, Dr. John Joseph, chairman of education division, Dr. Krishna Kumar, my dear fellow pharmacists, IPA members, respected faculty members, and distinguished invitees, and dear, dear students. Warm greetings on this occasion. Indeed, it's a proud moment for all of us to celebrate National Science Day on 28th of February, as we know, to commemorate the discovery of Raman effect by C. V. Raman, who brought the first Nobel Prize in Science to our land in 1930. As you know, this year's theme is Global Science for a Global Wellness. The theme has strong bonding with the pharmacy profession. Pharmacy, as you know, pharmaceutical sciences is involved in drug discovery, development, manufacturing, quality control, clinical studies, and medicine management. All requires a, a background of science, and indeed, we are much committed to the society and well-being of the people. Pharmacy is well supported in the well-being of the society and pharmacy program is unique in the sense that uh, science, technology, and clinical practice are embedded as well as it is in the curriculum for uh, the PG programs as well as all the programs. We have, but however, we have to translate our achievements of science and technology for global wellness. That shall be our mission. And we are proud that, uh, we are proud about Indian pharmaceutical industry. India is known as the pharmacy of the world. This achievement of Indian pharma sector is due to the commendable service and contribution of our scientists and engineers, as well as pharmacists in research and development. We witness how effectively our pharma industry and biotechnology firms served the mankind during the COVID-19 pandemic. The science education research shall be for a purpose, not for simply for getting a degree. As a, as a teachers, we have more responsibility to inculcate research mindset in our students. 
teaching research nexus is an important tool where our faculty can bring their own research in the classroom to stimulate research in, the, in our students. The critical thinking ability to be fostered, promoted nicely in the classroom. We have our students, of, we have to make our students a great thinkers, processing inquisitiveness to know things that, uh, that they have to ask questions, they have to bring the hypothesis, research questions to mind, even in the undergraduate level. Let us uh, uh, promote them to ask questions, why, what, why it happens, what, how it happens. These are the key words to make them uh, challenging and critical thinking. Let them ask questions in the class, let them find the answers or we can support them. Dear students, please identify your research interest if, with the help of our mentors as well as teachers uh, so that uh, when you take a research project in undergrad. No doubt, science club, uh, journal club, as well as debate club would help, uh, help us to foster the critical thinking as well as the research culture in the campuses. Main objectives of this year, National Science Day is to spread the importance of science and its application for the well-being. Let us encourage the talents in our campuses to start working the research projects, startups and incubators for a sustainable growth as well as the future of a nation. And let the, there can be an industry academy partnership for a nation's socio-economic development and well-being. Nation's educational policy do support us uh, for a teaching learning process to be blended with the quality education research. Therefore, research has to be more emphasized to bring research in the, we have to bring more science in the scientific field. Let us uh, take this opportunity to thank the team consisting of uh, Dr. Adil Rashid, Dr. Bovin, John, Dr. Sabida, and Dr. David Paul, who took a proactive role to organize this webinar in a BFT manner. I am sure that keynote address by Professor Belram sir and other scientists would ignite the mind of the young faculty as well as students and stimulate their research culture. Let us hope more and more discoveries will take place in India, especially in the medical sciences. Let me conclude stating the famous quote of uh, C.V. Raman, ask the right questions and nature will open her doors to you. Thank you once again for joining the National Day Webinar and stay safe and blessed and happy national days jai hind thank you very much thank you jai sagar sir so before going to the inaugural ceremony i would like to invite dr k krishna kumar sir chairman education forum ipa ksb and principal of st james college of pharmaceutical sciences chalakudi to introduce the topic and our chief guest Padmabhushan Professor P. Balram, sir. So, Krishna Kumar, sir, please. Thank you. Am I audible? Yeah, yeah. A very good afternoon, Tohan and all. The president of today's function, Dr. P. Jaisagar, sir, the president of IPA, and the secretary of IPA, John Joseph, sir, and legendary of science, we can say, Dr. Professor Atma Bhushan and Atma Sri, Atma Nab and Balram sir, our chief guest, and also the other distinguished scientist, Dr. Ajay Damodaran Pula sir, and our two young scientists, Dr. Chandran R, and also Dr. Brinta S. Kumar, and my dear colleagues, the principals, Mohammed, Dr. Mohammed Ani Fassar, the Maulana College Principal, and Amrita School of Pharmacy Principal, Dr. Sabida Madam, and also my friend, Dr. Arun Rashid and Agas Maridagam, and all other dignitaries, and my dear, dear, dear students of all the participants from the various colleges and the faculty members. Indeed, it's an honor for every one of us. Today, we get a legendary in science and technology. It's none other than an Indian scientist, Professor Patmanabhan Balram sir, an eminent Indian scientist, well known in the scientific community worldwide. Sir has completed his bachelor degree in chemistry from Ferguson College, Una University, and he took his master's degree 
in chemistry iit kanpur then he took his phd from kar carnegie university carnegie mellon university after a short postdoctoral stint with the nobel laureate robert burns wedward from harvard university he joined his molecular biophysics unit at an indian institute of science bangalore as a later become the director of the esteemed institute indian institute of science professor belrams sir's outstanding contributions involving the core areas of peptide design and conformational analysis peptide natural products is the dr kishan got muted mute mute type is ah it's okay sir when it's muted just now just, just now just now okay sir okay the mass spectroscopy of proteins and peptides then trio phosphate isomerase tim from plasmodium falciparum and the computational analysis on protein structures his seminal work can be evidenced from an h index of 75 and with more than 22693 citations which he has led to the success of multiple drug discovery programs around the world in recognition of his far ranging contributions and services he was awarded with padma shri in 2002 padma bhushan in 2014 shanti swarup patnakar award 1986 we indians are considering that is the nobel prize of indians we proud of you sir insa medal for young scientist 1977 and the world academy of science in 1994 recently with our bruce merfield award of 2021 at american peptide symposium so such a great and honor personality is there today for our this science day inauguration as well as for the keynote address sir his uh, giving the topic is reflections on science in the age of the corona virus with due respect on behalf of all our ipa team i warmly wholeheartedly invite you sir for today's topic thank you sir thank you krishna kumar sir so with the all due respect and honor i welcome our chief guest patmabhushan professor p balram sir for inaugurating our webinar today and also for delivering the keynote address sir the session is all yours uh, i'm going to share my screen and probably take a little while to come on can you see this slide yes sir can you make it a slide show sir i will but can you see it partially yeah, we can see sir okay i'll make it slide show now this always takes a little time on zoom can you see it now Oh, nice, nice. Yes. Okay. Good afternoon to all of you. I'd like to thank uh, 
Dr. Jay Shekhar, and of course, Dr. Krishna Kumar for uh, introducing me so kindly. Uh, what I am going to do on this Science Day talk is to talk generally about science, but I've titled this as Reflections on Science in the Age of the Coronavirus. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the history of the coronavirus. I'll tell you a little biology, a little chemistry, and towards the end, some reflections on the evolutionary history of the coronavirus spike protein during the pandemic. The National Science Day, uh, as you've already been told, is uh, to mark C.V. Raman's announcement on the 28th of February, 1928, of the discovery of the Raman effect. He did this at a meeting of the South India Science Association in Bangalore at that time. A couple of years later, of course, his effect uh, was so well recognized that he received the Nobel Prize. Ever since February 28th was declared a science day, we have one day in which to reflect on science. And one might ask first, what is science? Now, I would define science as the study of nature. Now, of course, you might turn around and ask me, what is nature? So in anticipation of your question, I searched for a definition of nature. And the best definition that I found was in the very first volume of the science journal, Nature. This is produced since 1869. And in November of 1869, when volume one, number one of the journal Nature appeared, the new editors did not write an editorial. Instead, they asked the famous biologist Thomas Huxley to write an essay. Huxley did not write anything. What he did was he translated from the German an essay written by the German poet von Goethe in the 18th century. What Goethe said was this. He defines nature. He says we are surrounded and embraced by her, powerless to separate ourselves from her and powerless to penetrate beyond her. So when we study everything around us, whatever it be, sometimes even if we study ourselves, we are in fact studying nature. And therefore, we are carrying out science. Nature is remarkable. One feature of science, which you would see in textbooks, even in high school, is the global carbon cycle, where between plants and animals, you see this remarkable economy of nature. Plants are able to fix carbon dioxide, produce carbohydrates. In the process, they take water and split it and produce oxygen. Animals, on the other hand, use this oxygen at the end of the electron transport chain as an electron acceptor, and this way they're able to burn the nutrients that they have and produce the energy which is needed for life. So it is a perpetual cycle and the energy for this, of course, comes from the energy that we receive from the sun and plants do photosynthesis. But in order to understand everything around us in terms of science, we need chemistry. And when we look at chemistry, we have Mendeleev and we have his periodic table. Now, if you look at the periodic table itself, you find two elements, carbon and silicon, in the same vertical column. Now, if you look at carbon, carbon is essential for biology, it's essential for life. All of organic chemistry depends upon carbon. Silicon, on the other hand, is the key element which is powering the digital information age because you will find silicon in all your electronic devices. But silicon cannot substitute for carbon in life processes. Where do all these elements come from? These elements, of course, come from the stars. 
And in a book that I would like to introduce to you, which appeared in the 1970s, called The Ascent of Man, the theoretical physicist Jacob Bronowski traces how man evolved over the ages and how every step in the cultural evolution of human beings was driven by an advance in science and technology. He talks about the production of elements. He says, in all the stars, there are going on processes which build up the atoms one by one into more complex structures. Matter itself evolves. The word comes from Darwin and biology, but it is the word that changed physics in my lifetime. He goes on to describe how carbon is formed in a star. It's formed with three helium nuclei collide at one spot. This happens within less than a millionth of a millionth of a second, 10 to the minus 12 of a second. Bronowski then adds, every carbon atom in every living creature has been formed by such a wildly improbable collision. Therefore, you must remember that life itself is an extremely improbable event, and we must really celebrate it, and we must celebrate it with the science which tries to understand life. Science rests on three legs, the stool of science, data, theory, and communication. So we collect data, we worry about what this data means, and once we've got a hypothesis or a theory, we then communicate it to others. I've decorated the slide with pictures of some of the most famous scientists of the past centuries, Copernicus, Harvey, Jenner, and Darwin. But in order to do science, we need to observe nature. But in order to observe nature, we need some tools. For a long time, we had only one thing, what we were naturally endowed with, that is our eyes. So we could only see the world as our eyes saw them. But two inventions, the telescope and the microscope, changed science forever. The telescope allowed Galileo to look into the skies and then eventually see the vastness of the universe. The field of cosmology was born. The Dutchman Leeuwenhoek constructed the microscope. And he looked at a drop of tap water under the microscope and found these little animals, he called them, sort of swimming around in the water. Those were microorganisms, bacteria. Leeuwenhoek had now discovered the field of microbiology. So scientists always need tools. You might ask, what are the ways of doing science? One way is to observe and classify. The two exemplars of observation and classification are Darwin and Mendeleev. Darwin observed nature in the Galapagos Islands on his famous voyage and came upon the ideas of natural selection as a driver of the evolutionary process. Mendeleev catalogued the known elements arranged them according to their properties, discovered many gaps in his arrangement, and produced the periodic table which guided chemistry ever since. It was only after atomic theory came into physics was Mendeleev's periodic table fully understood. There is another way of doing science, and that is to do experiments and to make observations. Raman did exact, exactly this. He was doing an experiment on the scattering of light, and he observed that the scattered light had a different frequency. That is experiment and observation. The exemplar of this in the 19th century was Pasteur. Pasteur discovered many things. He's the father of organic stereochemistry. He observed the relationship between optical activities and the structures of molecules. Molecules were really not known at that time. Their structures were not known. He's the founding father of the field of microbiology, and he gave us vaccines. He also gave us the dictum that chance favors the prepared mind. So if you're doing science, you must do a lot of experiments. And if you do a lot of experiments, 
the chances of finding interesting observations increase. Later on in the 19th century, there's Faraday. Faraday produced the connection between electricity and magnetism. Most of you would have done this experiment. Current flowing in a circular coil generates a magnetic field perpendicular. You have a magnet which rotates, it generates an electric field. This connection between electricity and magnetism was explained by theory. The theory produced by James Maxwell some years later. And the theoreticians have done a great deal for science. Ludwig Boltzmann, for example, was studying heat. He asked, what is heat? And from this question of what is heat, he realized that heat is the random water of atoms. Therefore, he had this idea of entropy. He had the idea of atoms. He's the first man to recognize atoms. And atoms are very important now in understanding everything in chemistry and in your own discipline of the pharmaceutical science. But let me turn to the coronavirus. The coronavirus appeared in India in March of 2020. And over the next two years, an enormous number of people fell, fell ill and people all over the world have fallen ill and many, many people have died. The global death toll now is a staggering 6.6 .6 million. And in the United States alone, one of the most advanced countries of the world, the death toll is well in excess of 1 million people. And this is in the years 2021 and 2020. Now, when we've looked at how to eliminate the coronavirus, we've come across many, many non-scientific approaches. They have been pushed by public figures. Therefore, you must understand the science behind the coronavirus if you're going to tackle it. What's a virus? The best definition of a virus that I found during the pandemic was in this book called Aristotle to Zoos, which is subtitled The Philosophical Dictionary of Biology. This was written by the famous English immunologist, Peter Medover. And Medover says that a virus is a piece of bad news wrapped up in protein. The bad news is the nucleic acid or the genetic material which provides the instructions for the virus to replicate itself, to multiply. But it's wrapped up in a coat of protein and in the case of the coronavirus, which is an enveloped virus, also with a phospholipid bilayer. So this is what the coronavirus really looks like. A spherical particle with those brown projections are protein molecules, the so-called coronavirus spike protein. I show it to you in cross-section on the right-hand side of the slide. And the blue barrier that you see in which the spike protein is embedded it's a phospholipid bilayer. It's a membrane. It's a membrane which is formed by molecules which are rather like detergents themselves. More than a century ago, the founding father of modern medicine, William Osler, he said that soap and water and common sense are the best disinfectants. This is why we were advised to wash our hands with soap and water during the pandemic and also with alcohol-based sanitizers. What they will do is they will dissolve that blue membrane that you see on the slide. What was missing, of course, during the pandemic, very many times, was common sense. Why should we study the coronavirus? Best advice has been given in a movie, in the Godfather 2 movie by Michael Pollion. He says, keep your friends close, but your enemies closer. Which means that if the coronavirus is a declared enemy, we should know everything about it. So when the pandemic started, I asked myself the question, who discovered the coronavirus? And I found this paper in 1967, and this was also being discussed at that time in the literature, uh, the lady on the, on the right is June Almeida, and she took the electron micrograph that you see in the middle. That is the picture 
which gives the coronavirus its name. You can see spherical cross-section and you can see projections on the surface which look like a corona. Now it turns out that the virus of which they took these pictures had an abbreviated name. It was called 229E. And then I found when I read this paper that this train 229E, I've marked it in yellow here, was actually isolated by two people called Hamro, Hamri and Prokno in 1966. So I went back then to the literature and found this paper in 1966 and found that there was a lady, now I knew it was a lady, Dorothy Hamre, who isolated the coronavirus in 1966. She got this from looking at the nasal secretions of students who came to the University of Chicago's health center. They would come in with colds and she was trying to isolate the virus which was responsible. She actually did some of the most remarkable work. She found the size of the virus. She knew it was an RNA virus and she demonstrated many scientific facts about the virus. I, found, I wrote a little bit about this during the pandemic, but what I want to show you here are the pictures of the people who discovered the coronavirus. They are the English virologist, David Terrell, at the bottom, the electron microscopist, June Almeida, and the virologist, Dorothy Hamre, who isolated the coronavirus for the first time. But although this was isolated in 1967, not much work was done on it afterward. And in 1996, David Terrell wrote this in a medical textbook. He said that coronaviruses cause acute, mild, upper respiratory infection, and in brackets, he said, common cold. After this, everybody lost interest in studying the coronavirus, and those people who give money for research also lost interest in funding coronavirus research. In 2003, the coronavirus re-emerged. There was a patient who was discovered in the Vietnam French Hospital of Hanoi who had a very infectious disease because the other medical staff were also becoming sick. The Vietnamese government asked the WHO for help and they sent the person who's pictured on the slide, Carlo Urbani. He arrived in Vietnam and persuaded the government to impose extraordinary quarantine measures on March 9th, 2003. Why do I show you this today? Because you will see that this diagnosis, that this is a new disease was made on the 28th of February, 2003, exactly 20 years ago. This disease was prevented from spreading by this quarantine measures. Armani himself contracted the disease and he died on March 29, 2003. So you can see it was extraordinarily infectious. In less than a month after he'd identified the disease, he was dead. It caused 8,000 infections and 800. But let me make a digression into chemistry. We need to understand chemistry if you're going to understand the coronavirus. And if you're really going to understand pharmacology, pharmaceutical chemistry, and so on. The best Definition of chemistry was given by Arthur Kornberg, the man who discovered the enzyme DNA polymerase and fired the first shot of the biotechnology revolution. Kornberg called chemistry the lingua franca of the medical and biological science. How do chemistry and biology differ? They differ in length scales, in time scales, and in energy scales. At one end of the of this figure, are molecules, ethane, glucose, larger molecules like hemoglobin. But as we come to the middle of the scale, you have larger biological structures, the ribosome, a virus, a mitochondria, an entire blood cell, a bacterial cell, and so on. But everywhere there are atoms, and these atoms are moving, so the time scales of dynamics are different. The energy scales are also different. But there is no fundamental physics difference between chemistry and biology. In chemistry itself, you have these two branches, inorganic chemistry and organic chemistry. They were united in Bohler's famous experiment. They heated ammonium cyanate and produced urea. Urea, of course, is a substance produced by the kidneys. 
And he wrote in a letter to Bazelius then that in a manner of speaking, I can no longer hold my chemical water. I must tell you that I can make urea without the use of kidneys of any animal, be it man or dog. You can see the excitement of science in Bowler's letter. Biochemistry was born when Buchner discovered that sucrose could be converted into alcohol without the help of the yeast cell, but with a soup which was prepared after the cells themselves had been crushed and broken. So this was the new science of biochemistry. Both of these are necessary for us to understand the virus. Let's return to the virus now. Today, modern techniques, particularly electron cryo microscopy, allow us to get the detailed structure of the virus. Today, you can see this is how the virus looks like. We know everything about it. And that protein which projects out of the virus, its structure is known in atomic detail. Over the last Two years, 160,000 structures of this protein have actually been determined in different places in the world. We know how the protein binds to its receptor. We know how we can use these structures in order to try and make new drugs, although no new drugs have been made for the coronavirus. We can try and understand how vaccines work if we have these structures. But all these structures are large structures connected of molecules in which atoms are connected to atoms, to atoms, and to atoms. Thousands and thousands of atoms put. It is here that you must understand the importance of atoms. In Feynman's famous lectures on physics at Caltech, in volume one, number one, he starts, matter is made up of atoms. And then he asks a question. If in some cataclysm, all of scientific knowledge were to be destroyed and only one sentence passed on to the next generation of creatures, what statement would contain the most information in the fewest words? This is an important question because in the 1960s, he was thinking about nuclear war as the cataclysm. In 2023, we still have the problem of nuclear war hanging over everybody's head. Feynman answered his question. He said, I believe it is the atomic hypothesis or the atomic fact or whatever we wish to call it, that all things are made up of atoms. And this, I think, is the most important statement. If all scientific knowledge is gone, at least the atomic hypothesis must be there to kickstart the evolution of science. Do viruses live? Are they living organisms? It turns out that most biologists will exclude viruses from the tree of life. But at the same time, viruses are important in exchanging genes across the super kingdoms of life, plants, animals, and so on. A little digression into biology. Nothing in biology can be understood except in the light of evidence. And this is Darwin himself saying that there's grandeur in this view of life. It's several powers having been originally bricked by the creator into a few forms or into one. And that while this planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity, from so simple a beginning, endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful, have been and are being evolved. So very beautiful forms continue to be evolved. And in many ways, new viruses will also continue to evolve in the future. There are three pillars of modern biology. The first, of course, is Darwin and evolution, variation and selection. The other is Mendel, whose 200th anniversary was celebrated last year, gave us genetics. And genetics and evolution are connected by the chemistry of DNA. DNA was discovered by Oswald Avery in 1944. And the detailed chemistry of DNA was embodied in the Watson Crick double helical structure, which most of you might have studied. But that tells you how. The chemical nature of the bases, base pairing, changes in bases, and so on, lead to variation in molecules and subsequent action. Today, science has advanced so far, especially the biological sciences, that the genomes, the entire genomes, sequences of thousands of eukaryotic organisms are now known. This is an old slide. But I show you this just to emphasize the unity of biology. 
in this vast tree which is constructed, you can see in neighboring branches we have humans, chimpanzees, rats, mice, pigs, cattle, sheep, horses, and dogs. So sometimes when you look at all the battles that we wage in real life about pigs and cattle and other animals, you can see that as far as biology is concerned, we are in fact pretty close. I'd like to sort of come to the end of my presentation by drawing your attention to something scientific which you would have heard during the pandemic. One corona variant after another appeared. What are these variants? These variants are variants in which the sequence of the spike protein, which I show you on the slide, will change. I want to show you a paper, an old paper of 1970, which explains mutation and selection. And the evolutionist John Maynard Smith wrote this. He took a word, the four-letter word, W-O-R-D, word. He made one change, he got the word war. He made another change, he got the word go. He made another change, he got the word gone. Made one more change, he got the word gene. But what is the characteristic of all these words? All five words have meaning in the English language. And what Minard Smith said was, this is the variation also in protein structures. The amino acids change. Each amino acid is given a one letter code. The letters may change. But the mutant now has meaning and it may now be retained by the organism. And slowly, over a period of time, new functions will evolve. This is variation and also selection at the level of molecules. Today, of course, those who search for meaning in protein sequences have titles like this, the Library of Maynard Smith, Search for Meaning in the Protein Universe. Frances Arnold won the Nobel Prize a few years ago for her work on bacterial evolution. Now, this is what the coronavirus spike protein is. It's a large polypeptide of 1,273 amino acids. That means we will represent it as 1,273 letters in a sentence. Each one of these letters can change, and there are 20 ways in which it can change. So there's an enormous space of variation in a sequence. But this protein is very important because it guides the virus into the cell, just like the Trojan horse, which the Greeks employed to get into the fortress of Troy. So the virus is attracted to the cell because of this protein. The cell binds it, and once it's found, it goes inside. Today, we can map those variations. And during the course of the pandemic, beginning on January 1st of 2020, you can see that 1080 is there on the x-axis. That is 1,080 days since January 1st of 2020. Variants have come and gone. And the most recent variant, of course, is this variant over here, which is another variant of the Omicron, which is going up. But I'm coming to the end. If you want to understand the pandemic and look at viruses, we must go back and look at things which are written when the AIDS pandemic began. In the Journal of the American Medical Association, one of the most famous scientists in the 20th century, Joshua Lederberg, wrote an article, Medical Science, Infectious Disease, and the Unity of Humankind. And he said, human intelligence, culture, and technology have left all other plant and animal species out of the competition. We also may legislate human behavior, but we have too many illusions that we can, by writ, govern the remaining vital kingdoms, the microbes that remain our competitors of last resort for dominion of the planet. The bacteria and viruses know nothing of national sovereignties. In that natural evolutionary competition, there is no guarantee that we will find ourselves to survive. Where did the coronavirus come from? Throughout the pandemic, people have worried about was it natural evolution from a bat to an intermediate animal? Or was it created in the laboratory with the new techniques of virology? When I talked about this during the pandemic, I was reminded of a poem that I studied in school written by the 18th century English poet William Blake. He worried about two animals, the lamb and the tiger. 
all animals have bilateral symmetry. Therefore, we always like symmetric objects. He says, what immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? He's talking about the tiger. Did he smile his work to see? Did he who made the lamb make thee? He asks this question. And of course, one might look at the coronavirus, which is on the right-hand side of the slide. It's also a wonderfully symmetric object. It actually looks beautiful. It's also fearful. When we look at it, we get afraid. We wonder where it is. And even yesterday's newspaper says there are still worries about whether it actually emerged from the So, In concluding this Science Day presentation and in sort of inaugurating your uh, the function of science day. I have to ask one question. Have you learned any lessons from the pandemic? I think we have. Nature periodically provides a reminder of the limits of human arrogance. The number of world leaders who declared that they had won over the virus is many, but we have paid a terrible cost. Hello. Nature Hello. also demonstrates Stop. that the frontiers of science are truly endless. The last, of course, is a more specific one. That is, biology, assisted by the chemistry of molecular variation, is a formidable force. With that, I will conclude my presentation and only acknowledge the two institutions which have provided me shelter through much of my professional life, the Indian Institute of Science on the top left, and the National Center for Biological Sciences, the bottom right. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, the... Thank you so much, Belram, sir. The session was very unique and conservative. Sir, uh, the one thought uh, which one thought... I noted was chance favors the prepared mind. Sir, let your session be an inspiration to all the aspiring young researchers to build up a research mindset. So now to express the official gratitude to our chief guest, Professor B. Bel B. Belram, sir, once again, I invite Dr. K. Krishnakumar, sir. Sir, please. Sir, your presentation was very nice. And uh, we have, uh, you have started in a simple way. You have started with uh, the periodic table uh, for our students regarding the importance of the carbon and the silicon. And the carbon is mainly for the biology and for our life. And uh, for the silicon, you uh, given an idea regarding only for the digital information. And you have given the importance of the nature and for the global carbon cycle. And also you have given the uh, making of the microbiology and the importance of cosmology. And you have touched with the last the coronavirus. It is a protein molecule and also phospholipid biolayer. And you have given about the changes taking place in the uh, coronavirus and the importance of uh, virus one and the uh, spike of the virus two that is containing it's around 1,273 residues. And uh, also uh, the what the human being has with the arrogance, the reduction of arrogance and the effect of this uh, coronavirus in after that pandemic infections. So thank you very much, sir. We have. Indeed, we are very grateful to you. So many new informations we have received regarding especially to the uh, DNA part and the gene technology of this virus. On behalf of IPA and all the organizers, uh, we uh, express our wholehearted gratitude and uh, thanks to you, sir. And uh, we are uh, giving a recognition of this certificate also on behalf of IPA. We are giving you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, sir. So all the participants will be given the e-certificate once the Google form appearing in the chat box is filled in. Once again, all the participants will be given the e-certificate once the Google form appearing in the chat box is filled in. Now, I would like to call upon Dr. Mohammed Hanifa, Principal, Mawlana College of Pharmacy, Perindalmana, 
to introduce our next topic and speaker, Dr. Ajay Damodaran Pillai, sir. Sir, please. Hello, <clears throat> am I audible? Yes, sir, you're audible. Okay, uh, warm good evening. <clears throat> With immense pleasure, let me introduce the speaker of today, Dr. Ajay Damodaran Pillai. Dr. Ajay Damodaran Pillai, he completed his uh, uh, M. Farm Pharmaceutical Chemistry from Gujarat University and his PhD in Chemistry from Bhavnagar University, Gujarat. And later on, he started his career as a uh, Senior Research Investigator, Medicinal Chemistry Division, GVK Bioinformatics, Hyderabad, and moved on to the Department of Pharmaceutical Chemistry, MS Ramaya College of Pharmacy as Assistant Professor. Currently, he is working as Scientist D, Head Project Management Cell, National Center for Cell Science, Pune. Dr. Ajay uh, has vast experience in research administration and his areas of interest are grants management, ethics, licensing and IP, uh, medicinal chemistry and biochemistry, et cetera, et cetera. He has got four US patents and one Brazil patent and one Indian patent. And he has got several uh, publications in international peer-reviewed journals. So with uh, immense pleasure with this brief note, let me invite Dr. Ajay Damodaran Pillai to present the topic, a successful career in science. Sir, please. Uh, you have to allow me uh, to share my slides. Okay, sir. You joined us in NCC, no? Uh, yes. Dr. Bobby? Yes, sir. Can you make it? Yeah, one second. Did you make it? Yeah, yeah. Dr. Damar, please. Okay. Uh, can you see my screen? Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Jay Shekhar and the entire IPA chapter of Kerala for giving this opportunity. Um, so I, I will only take 10 minutes to discuss uh, this topic, uh, successful career in science. Um, so let's start uh, with defining a, a career. If you see the literal meaning in the dictionary, a career is an occupation undertaken for a significant period of time in a person's life, right? So now uh, when we define a, a successful career, you know, the, the definition slightly changes. Uh, you know, there, there, there will be a uh, change in the definition of a successful career. It's a passion pursued for a significant period of the person's life and with opportunities for progress to attain a goal. So you can see that some additional adjectives have gotten into the uh, definition. Uh, you know, there are words like passion, uh, opportunities to progress, uh, attaining a goal. Um, uh, so, so that means that there is definitely a difference between a career and a successful career. And we also know people who continuously work even after 80 years. I mean, uh, thanks uh, Professor Beltran sir for a wonderful talk. Uh, he is one of the finest mentors we have in India today. And, uh, you know, all of them work even, uh, you know, uh, even after retirement and many people work after 80 years. We uh, sometimes feel, uh, you know, it's very surprising for us that, you know, how do they hang on for so, so much time with so much energy and enthusiasm? So that, uh, that definitely tells us that, you know, there is, there is a very, very close association between success and hope. 
uh, they're all goal oriented uh, people they have definitely goals in their life to attain and that journey is what we call a success um but just with a few goals and uh, you know uh, a journey called success we may not be able to reach the goal you definitely have to have a pathway and we have to have a vehicle to travel and attain uh, those goals for me uh, ambition is the path i mean if you don't have an ambition there is no path uh, the path for you to take is the ambition and uh, the vehicle which we normally use uh, is the persistence so if you don't have the pathway and if you don't have the vehicle uh, it's very hard to talk about a successful uh, career now the challenging thing is uh, how do you even know what your passion is i mean it's very difficult to know what the passion is much early on in your career uh, it's really difficult uh, because you know uh, we don't know what is a passion when we are in standard when you are doing a plus 2 or when you are even doing your b pharmacy but definitely there are some biomarkers which uh, will help you to test this uh, for example uh, when you do an experimental practicals uh, in you know b farm or in your m pharmacy does does that experiment interest you or if you don't go to the laboratory at day uh, do you ever miss the laboratory uh where you have been learning science as a school student as you are now uh if the answer for these questions is s s and s uh then definitely you know you you are trying to find a passion to become a researcher or a scientist uh once you have the passion uh, uh to become an established scientist uh, there are some unique qualities which you have which you you should be ready to digest failures you should be able to manage uh, challenging situations uh, in science uh, you should be able to multitask uh, you know several events on a given day these these are some of the unique qualities uh, we are looking uh, when we talk about established science i personally feel that uh, it's a very singular privilege to become a successful scientist there are a lot of bonus points to become a successful scientist or a scientist Uh, for that matter, I mean, you basically choose the question you wish to address. You decide the direction to travel. You reinvent and become part of great discoveries. Uh, you know, you can join the international community. You can travel with people who like science, who have common interest. Um, you know, working with PhD students are always, you know, it, 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 they keep you and and uh, energetic. you have a flexible daily schedule i mean you can work long weekends you, nobody is going to question that you come on saturdays and sundays and work in the lab right and um, you know by all by doing all of that uh, you know you get some by products i mean awards recognitions and all of by products i don't think that we never walk into the lab uh, to get an award i mean you work hard in the lab and uh, during the course of your career i mean awards and recognitions will follow uh the other advantage of uh, you know becoming a scientist is uh, you know you also get to uh, you know uh, play different role when you are in the job you can be a part of administrative responsibilities you can be engaging with industries you can be engaging at the government at policy level you will be an advisor for the government you can go to schools and colleges teach children and be a part of the educational initiatives you can you can be the chair of committees and just for the your science so there are a lot of uh, different advantages or opportunities out there when you work as a scientist or when you are associated with a academic institution uh so what it means is uh, you are paid for your hobby to do something right so this is this is what you like it is your passion and that's why the institution of the government gives you salary so how do you start uh, i mean everyone uh who like to become a researcher or who like to become a scientist you know they, they we all start with ideas right and ideas are never bought by people unless you show an evidence and data to support those ideas nobody is going to give you money to prove an idea unless you give them some evidence and data to support it so whole whole career in science for a student to uh, to get into science to get recognized as a scientist uh you always have to have some kind of a road map so for me uh, you know it all starts with observation 
uh, you know, the observations uh, lead to curiosity and it leads to reading. Uh, reading, reading and reading is the core, uh, you know, uh, attribute uh, which you all have to attain um, if you are going to establish your career in science, because reading is going to give you knowledge. It gives you, uh, you know, information about people who are working in your field of choice. It helps you to uh, scientifically engage with scientists, because if you want to write, if you, you know, choose the right lab, if you want to discuss uh, with a Nobel laureate, for example, in an escalator, uh, without you, you know, a basic knowledge in the field where you're working, you cannot scientifically engage. And once you choose the right lab, 50% of the work is done. Then you, know, you are passionate, you have the uh, you know, reading ability, you are curious to know more things. Definitely, you know, the, the student is going to refine his or her skill sets. Uh, they will be helping the supervisor design experiments. They will be working on the leadership skills. All of that will happen. And this is what, and this is what uh, you know, is going to um, convert the ideas um, into uh, translational ideas where you have uh, the ability to give evidence and data to support your ideas. Now, how do you uh, uh, even choose a research question? So if you want to uh, choose a research question, um, that it's, it's not very complicated. There are very uh, you know, few steps in that. Uh, some you know, tackle a problem which interests you. That's, that's one thing which I always think that you, know, you should work in an area which is interesting to you. You should be the one who is going to be interested uh, uh, you know, before anyone gets interested. And uh, the area should expose you to new techniques so that you work for five ten years, you, you master new techniques, and uh, you uh, you try to address a question which is uh, value, um, uh, and it's really uh, challenging to address. Uh, I personally think that um, the basic knowledge which you develop is uh, going to be helpful to address uh, you know uh, other questions in science, and this knowledge base will be useful for other scientists to take it forward. Don't worry about your, your, your area of research. Uh, it may not have uh, you know, very immediate uh, clinical uh, you know, ramifications, but definitely uh, your, your knowledge base, which you create your PhD should open doors uh, in biology. Uh, I also get questions, uh, uh, should we choose academia or should you uh, choose industry after your PhD uh, to establish a career? So both, both have their own uh, advantages and disadvantages. Uh, but for me, uh, you know, in, uh, an academic research should complement the industry interest, or the industry should offer opportunity for academic research. Uh, we all know that you know, university or academic institutions, you know, there's a there's a lot of flexibility to work around objectives, which is not very industry. It's very, very closer to the objectives. Uh, academy, Institutions definitely have limitations to funds or facilities for that matter, but industries generally do not have the limitations because they are more commercially minded. Um, whatever we do in the laboratory may not be scalable in industry. So that's that's a big difference working in industry and academy. Uh, when academic institutions focus on basic research, industry will be more of you know practical oriented uh, or product oriented research, uh, so that you know they have a commercial uh, motive behind whatever they do. Uh, academic institutions have an advantage of multi uh, disciplines. I mean, we have different departments and institutions where we can collaborate and uh, take the research further. Uh, and and that, that, that is a reason why industries basically come to academic institutions and start collaborating. Uh, the only challenge in academic institutions is that uh, a professor or an associate professor may not be given whole of the time to do research. I mean, he or she has to take part in education, administration, funding, fund generations, publications, all of that he or she has to do. But in industry, you can still uh, be very, very focused towards your uh, research and uh, product development. And in academia, we have a lot of grants now where you can uh, write uh, in uh, hand in hand with industries, uh, but industries generally outsource uh, you know, most of their work uh, to academic institutions or venture capitalists who can invest on other academic institutions to take the research forward. So uh, 
what are the career opportunities uh, once you become a scientist, especially from a pharmaceutical profession? Uh, uh, you know, there are a lot of career opportunities which we have uh, today. Um, Patents is one of the very, very uh, you know, lucrative area, it's a very challenging area. Uh, if, uh, and there are a lot of pharmaceutical uh, postgraduates and doctorates who uh, like to get into the area of patenting. Um, because pharmacy is a, a broad area uh, of discipline where you, you touch upon various subjects. I mean, uh, I have seen people as uh, advisors to grants and and program managers to uh, grant funding agencies like DBT, DST, uh, etc., where they they give their expertise uh, in evaluating grants. Uh, there, are, there are project managers and academic institutions who uh, basically lead uh, grants management cells for the institution. Uh, if you are good communicators in science with your breadth and depth of knowledge, you can take that as a profession, which is science communication. Uh, uh, if 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 you like journalism, uh, it's a very very interesting area, especially with the background of pharmaceutical sciences. Your engagement with industries, your uh, knowledge in drug uh, discovery, drug development, etc. That's a very uh, interesting area. Journalism. Uh, very very uh, recently, uh, in the last you know maybe a decade or so, uh, we start hearing about. Uh, you know, startups, incubation centers, etc., where uh, a lot of uh, engagement happens between industry and startups. Uh, they, those are the areas where you know pharmaceutical scientists play an important role. And uh, a few of my friends also work in policy writing, and they they head the scientific uh, uh, CASI, which is the coordinator for pushing the scientific activities for India and other countries. Uh, so they work as a work uh, at the interface of two uh, uh, federal organizations. So this, this, there are many career opportunities. I, I just thought I'd list some of the career opportunities which might be of interest uh, to you. Um, uh, uh, so uh, that's the reason I listed. Now, uh, my last slide uh, basically talks about some facts. Uh, so, so before uh, uh, you move into you know, a career of uh, a scientific career, uh, we must understand that the job is fabulous, but not every day is wonderful. Right? There, there will be tedious days, there will be long experimental days, and you should be ready to hang on and take that extra effort. Um, and there is definitely some element of insecurity. I mean, you can you work and get scooped uh, because there are other competitive labs working around the world. All experience doesn't work, so you should not get rejected. You should not get depressed, um, and uh, definitely, you know, there is some kind of a prom compromise which you have to do with personal life because uh, if you're in between the experiments and if if your family needs, uh, you know, for some some uh, functions, you may may not be able to commit uh, straight away. So, you know, that that, that those are some of the uh, facts which I think uh, we should understand. Um, before you move into science. In very rare cases, uh, you know, your PhD work is going to give a new drug or a device which is going to be marketable next day. It, it never happens like that. But I strongly feel that, uh, you know, the bulk of the knowledge which is created in a PhD program is uh, definitely going to be uh, useful for, uh, for the product development. And, and uh, if you're sure that a research gap is for you, uh, I'm sure that uh, there will no uh, there will be no obstacle that you can't overcome. And that's why I started the talk saying that there's the two attributes which you have to have is uh, you know the, the the ambition and the persistence, which is the path and the vehicle to take you from the success to the goals which you put in life. I just thought of putting some uh, websites which are going to be useful for uh, you know finding jobs or finding you know your career ahead. And I'll stop here and happy to take any questions. Thank you so much. So thank you so much, sir, for your valuable session. Let's hope we can see more and more successful young researchers from our country in future. So to give away the token of gratitude, once again, I invite Dr. Mohammed, sir. Sir, please. Uh, <clears throat> Am I audible? 
Yes, sir, you're audible. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ajay. Uh, on behalf of uh, IP Kerala State Branch, uh, I thank Dr. Ajay Damodaran Pillai for his uh, informative presentation on the topic, A Successful Career in Science. Now, uh, the session is open for discussion. If anyone has got a question, uh, he'll be happy to answer one or two as uh, we are running in short of time. Any queries? Sir, they can unmute and do it. Yeah, please. You can unmute and you can. End the high, end the high. I'm not going to get it. I'm not going to get it. You can uh, put in the chat box. Yeah. <laughs> Any queries? I think I'm in the chat box. Late, late, late evening, no? That may be the reason. <laughs> yeah, maybe everyone is. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. okay. Rushing back to home. Okay. Uh, so what are the basic uh, qualities one should have to have a successful career in the, uh, yes. Yes. Hello. After this question. Ajay, sir. Yeah, I can hear you. Sir, what are the basic qualities one should have to have a, a successful career as a researcher? I think that uh, you have to have the inquisitiveness to know things. I mean, you should be curious to uh, know things in your field of research. Okay. And uh, uh, that's what I discussed that you, know, you have to have the, uh, the curiosity and the persistence to stay uh, for longer years. Uh, we just heard a talk from Professor Del Trump, uh, you know, who, who has kind of dedicated his whole career in science, right? So, so uh, you know, he's a person who showed us, you know, who a successful scientist is. Uh, so I think that it's basically your your curiosity to know things and your your ability to persist and address those research questions is what is going to be making you um, a unique person in science. That's, that's my view. Thank you, sir. Uh, it was an eye opener for uh, many young budding researchers. So once again, on behalf of the organizers, there's some, uh, there's no, what muted in, there's no voice. Uh, Hello, am uh, I audible now? Now audible, now audible. Okay. Uh, it was a wonderful session and an eye opener for many young budding researchers. So once again, on behalf of uh, the organizers, IPA Kerala State Branch, I express my sincere gratitude to Dr. Ajay Damodaran Pillai for this informative session. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So before moving on to the next session, I would like to say that if the participants are having any queries, please type them on the chat box. Once again, if participants are having any queries, you can type them on the chat box. So now we are having the next two sessions in which we can hear from our young researchers. So to introduce the topic and speaker of our first session, Dr. Chandran R. May I invite Dr. Agash Maradagam, Professor and HRD, Pharmaceutical Chemistry, National College of Pharmacy, Calicut. Sir, please. Okay, am I audible? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay, okay. Okay, good evening to all. So, uh, nothing is impossible before the right attitude and sheer work. Here I am feeling proud and privileged to introduce Dr. Chandran, who fought against all odds to become the first ever PhD holder from his village. 
with a humble beginning from a government LP school, he had a successful journey all the way to most prestigious Sniper Mohali. He holds PhD in medicinal chemistry from Sniper Lucknow, MS Farm from Sniper Mohali, and uh, B Farm from Government College of Pharmaceutical Sciences, Kolkata. Throughout his academic career, Dr. Chandran has been the recipient of several prestigious awards, including Sniper JE fellowships for both his MS Farm and PhD programs. He has contributed significantly, significantly to the field of medicinal chemistry. Uh, Dr. Chandran's areas of research in, includes synthetic organic chemistry, research and development, and design of synthesis of design and synthesis of medicinal compounds. So, coming to today's topic of Dr. Chandran, smaller molecules in tuberculosis. Uh, tuberculosis remains one of the most challenging airborne infections caused by the Mycobacterium tuberculae and it is one of the deadliest disease and it has uh, and the, the most widespread problem is that the unavailability of effective drugs for the treatment of uh, this resistant drugs so uh, this particular session will focus on the details of experimental design optimization of reaction conditions of these uh, newer novel uh, small molecules for tuberculosis it's an honor to uh, introduce Dr. Chandran. Sir, please. Yeah, you can. I'm, I'm, I'm audible. audible. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, sir. You are audible. audible. Uh, okay, thank you, sir. Thank you for uh, introduction. The camera is not on camera. Can you switch on the camera? Okay. Okay, now it's uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So thank you, thank you so much, sir, for uh, introduction. Agas uh, sir. Uh, so my name is Chandran. So today I'm going to discuss development of small molecules as anti-tubercular agents. So we know that tuberculosis is one of the infectious drug, uh, disease affecting affecting uh, on the lungs basically. Later on, it extended to the other body parts through lymph nodes. So, costing the agent of the tuberculosis is uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis. It affects the one third of the population. So, now we are uh, recently, uh, main challenges in treatment was the drug resistance. So, now recently, uh, recently developed, developed after 14 years, Vedaculin, it was used for MDR, XDR TB. And later, later on, uh, 2014 uh, approved Delamanide. It's uh, one of the nitroimidazone containing moiety. And in 2019, recently uh, uh, approved another one drug. It is called Pitomanide, which is uh, also used in uh, drug resistance and other uh, pipeline. In, uh, recently, uh, 2019, uh, uh, WHO approved these three drugs for uh, treatment after uh, second line drugs so the the preclinical stu pre preclinical studies uh, include first it's a general statement first include lead identification so it is having uh, hts assay methods and cell based assays and then will be uh, primary assays it it include uh, in vitro activity toxicity chemical properties and it will be connected to secondary assays and also it's going to be uh, carried out structural activity relationships and uh, uh, further uh, will be developing uh, by using the computation technologies by uh, computation technology by docking studies some molecular modeling times to find the uh, better uh, the gap so uh, after once uh, it will uh, close with that uh, secondary assays then will be clinical trial then will be the uh, FDA approval of particular drug. So a uh, clinical trial will be the phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four. So phase one basically focusing on the safety and the doses of the drug. 
and will be the 70 percent of the phase one studies will be carrying to the phase two clinical trial and phase two will be focusing on the efficacy and phase three will be focusing uh, efficacy and the safety and so phase four will be uh, um, surveillance post market surveillance and uh, long-term safety this will the uh, uh, specific to the infectious disease drugs so we know that what is the uh, drug discovery challenges currently in TB. So we know that uh, first line drugs are having uh, resistance and second line uh, drugs are having more uh, toxicity and uh, uh, difficult to treat the MDR, XDR, TBs and uh, uh, combination of other uh, therapeutics. So we have to overcome uh, these problems by using effective drug against XDR, MDR, TBs, and also we have to target particularly non-replicating state of the organism and should be compatible with uh, other therapeutics. So, uh, organic sulfur heterocytes are important class of organic compounds. It is widely used in uh, uh, pharmaceutical as a drugs and synthetic intermediates. So, these are the drugs which are uh, containing uh, sulfur atom. So we have designed uh, new newer molecule having tetrahydrobenzothiazone. This is one of our one of the our designed scaffold. So uh, we start our uh, development of organic sulfur compound by a diaminone and uh, inaminated with uh, uh, ammonia and uh, thiocyanate with thi ammonium thiocyanate. So we uh, got the intermediate for the uh, thioalkyne preparation. So uh, this is a, a tethered amine alkane sulfate, which further we functionalize to uh, ammonium thiazone, uh, tetrahydrothiazinone and uh, sulfones and uh, all. So we know that what are the synthetic methods are available for making uh, carbon sulfur bond. So these are the methods which are included sulfur umbelone, dehydrogenation methods, electrophilic thioalkylination, alkyne umbelone, nucleophilic thiocyanation, and oxide thioalkylation. So our methods basically belongs to the sulfur umbelone, which is that R1SCN. It's a uh, intermediate for the Alkylation. So first we start our reaction. Uh, 39A di diaminone ammonium acetate ethanol we obtain 40A uh, product and in NBS ammonium thiocyanate, uh, thiocyanate we obtained our thiocyanated intermediate. Hello. So we have uh, synthesized around uh, six derivatives and respective. So this uh, this method having more advantages than literature report because these thiocyanates we are used as a source of sulfur and uh, it's operationally simple method with excellent aid. Later on, I have uh, uh, developed a new method for purification uh, without column chromatography of this uh, product synthesis. So for the synthesis of final product by 41A plus 41A uh, in uh, catalyst, in copper catalyst, in uh, astronautical as a solvent, in CCA carbonate as a base in one hour, we obtained 37 percentage of 43 as a final product in good yield. So remaining uh, uh, so catalyst having lesser uh, effect than uh, copper iodide. So these are the derivatives we have synthesized. So uh, it's a functionalization. So uh, the functionalization we took uh, uh, in amino thiocyanate in, thios in, in uh, astonitrile, C-zinc carbonate. We obtained the cyclic intramolecular cyclic product 44, 44A. And uh, aliphatic thiocyanate we took and we react with uh, uh, Astronitrile in presence of solvent in CCA government, we obtained intramolecular product uh, 44F. So further, we did the synthetic transformation via uh, by 
gram scale synthesis. So we took 41 years static intermediate and alkyne 40, 42 A in copper hydrate C6 armate. We obtained 43 A as 80% yield. We observed the color changes. Changes after 30 minutes, uh, it will be completely yellow color. So after uh, we functionalized that our uh, synthesized intermediate with MCPBA, oxidation with MCPBA, we obtained sulfon of 60% of yield and uh, cyclized by silver, silver nitrate in methyl cyanide. RT24 hours, we obtained 65% of uh, tetrahydrothiazinum. So we 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 conclude we we conclude the um, to find the mechanism of the reaction. So we took the 41A in a di, di internal alkyne in standard condition. We did not observe any products. So and the uh, alkylation of uh, reaction of internal alkyne bio uh, di ethyl ester. So 41 way we took and the uh, di ester alkyne. In standard condition, also we did not find any uh, product formation. And uh, next 49 we took and react with 42 a in uh, optimized condition. We did not observe the, any uh, uh, any uh, final product. In uh, uh, another substrate, we made 50 and uh, reacted 42 a incorporated C6 carbonate. So we did not observe the, this uh, sulfur alkyne bond. So it clearly says that it is uh, essential for this NH2 uh, in ortho position. So uh, another uh, control experiment, 14, 44A, reactive with 42A in optimized condition. So we did not observe any uh, product. So further, uh, further we uh, took another uh, substrate to react with aliphatic alkane in optimized condition, we observed dialkylated product. So it's a, it's maybe it's a due to the this aromaticity of the this benzothiazole ring. We believe. So this is the mechanism involved in first its formation of base abstract this proton. So it's uh, formed acetylate formation and followed by amine coordination through uh, sigma metathesis to release the 43 of final product and release the uh, cyanide. And in absence of copper hydrate, what happened? It undergo uh, intramolecular cyclization to form amino thiazole 44A. So these are the molecules. We are evaluated anti-tubercular activity. It having uh, moderate anti-tubercular activity. Uh, collaboration with uh, Dr. Siddharth Chopra, CSIR, CDRI, Lucknow. So the conclusion, heterocyclic compounds constitute the important backbone of modern pharmaceutical and medicinal chemistry. So we have developed new methods for synthesis of thiocyanated enamino, and also we are um, uh, synthesized thioalkylated uh, enaminones. And also we have synthesized another newer molecule, tetrahydrothiazinone. And we have eight, eight new compounds. We are evaluated anti-tubercular activity. So these are the published paper in organic letter in uh, 2020. So after that, I received this recognition certificate for this publication. And uh, after that, received a second prize uh, with a cash prize of 15,000 for the uh, student uh, research paper contest in Niper, uh, Niper Research Symposium. And also recently in 2023, we received a uh, CAS innovator number for our 31 new compounds from uh, American Chemical Society. So I thank you for the opportunity, support, encouragement of the K KPGA and all uh, my uh, supervisors, Dr. Kesarina Tiwari and uh, Dr. Abha Sharma for their support in their my journey. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. No. Thank you. Thank you. Me. Thank you so much, sir, for your informative session. So to give away the token of appreciation, once again, I invite Dr. Agash, sir. Sir, please. Uh, thank you, Chandran, sir. It was a... Thank you. Hello. 
Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chandran, sir. It was really a wonderful session. Uh, welcome, sir. Yeah, sir. Sir, uh, I, I thank on behalf of IPA for your wonderful lecture also. So I uh, ask any participants, do you have any query for that? Chandran, sir, do you have any, uh, do you have any query for Chandran, sir? Hope. Uh, Hello. Yeah, you, you can ask questions. Yes. You can unmute and ask questions. Okay. Then. Uh, uh, yes. Okay. Hello. Yes, please. Any questions? Okay, do uh, Dr. Akash. Okay, so thank you, Dr. Chandran, once again. And uh, yes, we will present a, just a symbolically a certificate for our, as our token of appreciation. Okay, thank you, sir. <laughs> okay, thank you, sir. So the next section will be taken by a young researcher, Dr. Brinda S. Kumar. To introduce the topic and the speaker, I invite Dr. Sabida M., Principal, Amrita School of Pharmacy, Amrita Vishwidya Pidam, Kochi. Ma'am, please. Thank you. Good evening to one and all. Uh, first of all, I, I hope I am audible. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. So first of all, my appreciations to the IPA Kerala State Branch for organizing this uh, National Science Day program in a very good manner, including sessions by eminent researchers as well as young researchers. So moving to the last session, uh, let me introduce the speaker. Dr. Brinda S. Kumar, who is Assistant Professor at the Department of Pharmaceutics, Amrita School of Pharmacy. Brinda completed her B-Pharm and M-Pharm in Pharmaceutics from Nirmala College of Pharmacy in Muvattupura, affiliated to Kerala University of Health Sciences. Soon after completion of her M-Pharm in the year 2016, she joined Amrita as Junior Research Fellow in a Department of Science and Technology Nanomission funded project and pursue, pursued her PhD. Uh, during her during her PhD, yeah. she has published yeah. a few good journal papers yeah. and published her research work in yeah. presented her research work in some national conferences as well. Uh, to introduce the topic, phenytoin sodium, as we all know, is a very established and old anti-epileptic drug, which is almost away from the clinic nowadays due to the uh, large number of peripheral side effects and is being replaced by the newer anti-epileptic drugs. So in this DST nanomission project, we had tried two different formulations of phenytoin sodium to reinvent it. Uh, and it was a trial to bring this established and beneficial drug back to the clinic. So Vrinda would be discussing one formulation, which is basically a nanomicellar based IV formulation to address the issues uh, uh, related to the existing conventional IV formulation of phenytoin sodium. So with this brief introduction, I invite Dr. Vrinda S. Kumar to talk on phenytoin sodium loaded nanomicellar IV formulation for seizure emergencies. Over to you, Vrinda. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for your introduction. So a warm good evening to one and all. So first of all, I would like to thank IPA Kerala branch and uh, its coordinators for inviting me to or uh, for this opportunity. And uh, my thesis topic is phenytoin sodium loaded nanomycelia IV formulation for seizure emergencies. And this work has done under the guidance of Dr. Sabitayan. 
So let's start with uh, what is seizure. Actually, seizure emergency is a prolonged seizure or frequently occurring seizure which needs an immediate medical attention. So one common type of seizure is uh, status epilepticus in which the, there will be a prolonged seizure for more than five minutes, which will lead to brain damage or brain death. So according to World Health Organization, the overall incidence rate of seizure in India it is between 9.9 .9 to 41 in 1 lakh per year. So it infers that this neurological condition affects a sizable population. So coming to the current therapy, the first line drug for first line drug for the seizure emergency include benzodiazepine class of drugs such as lorazepam, midazolam, whereas the second line drugs are phenytoin, sodium or its product for phenytoin, and the third line drugs are valproic acid, phenobarbitone, and levetiracetam. So moving to the advantages and disadvantages of these drugs, in case of first line drug, the main advantage is fast onset of action. That is within minutes itself, it will provide therapeutic activity, whereas the disadvantages are short half-life of nearly two hours. So mostly a second dose or a second line agent is needed to prevent the further seizure attacks. And the continuous use of this benzodiazepines cause respiratory depression. And it is reported that this class of drug cause CNS depressant activity also. So and moving to the second line drug, phenytoin sodium. So this drug has uh, uh, the long biological, it possesses long biological half-life of 10 to 22 hours and it is free from sedation. That are the advantages of this drug. And coming to the disadvantages, the first disadvantage is administration issue. The reason is that this drug is highly lipophilic in nature and even the salt form is insoluble in water. So upon administration, it will start to precipitate in blood. And uh, this marketed phenytoin sodium IV contains an additive known as propylene glycol. It will cause infusion site reaction. And the, usually the mode, uh, this administration is before administration, we need to mix it with uh, sodium chloride solution. And the mode of administration is slow IV push at a rate of 50 mg per minute. So even at this slow infusion rate, there will be uh, uh, hypotension followed by bradycardia and uh, sometimes cardiac arrhythmia is al also reported. And uh, the second, uh, and uh, in the second disadvantage is pharmacokinetic issue. That is uh, due to uh, due to high plasma protein binding and as well as due to uh, the uh, the inherent PGP efflux mechanism in the brain. The availability of this drug to the brain uh, uh, will be low. So the clinically a large dose is usually recommended. And the third disadvantage is slow onset of action of around 30 minutes. So moving to the its product phosphenetoin, it is highly lipophilic in nature. So due to that, uh, it is free from administration issue. So that is advantage. And uh, moving to disadvantage, the, it has no anti-epileptic activity before it is converting to phenytoin. So after its conversion, it will show the same properties of phenytoin. And the con conversion time is usually between 15 to 20 minutes. So such a time gap is critical for patients who are suffering from seizure. And the third line drug, in case of third line drug, the advantages are, the, adv the main advantage is lower peripheral side effect and disadvantages are CNS depressant effect and short half-life. So among this drug, we have selected phenytoin sodium or modal drug due to long biological half-life and non-sedative effect. So our aim is to overcome the administration issue as well as the pharmacokinetic issue associated with this conventional phenytoin sodium IV by developing a pluronic based nanomycelia for injection. So these are some uh, previous reported uh, works that is formulation approaches of phenytoin for improving its properties. But these papers doesn't address the administration as well as pharmacokinetic issues of this drug. So why we have selected nanomycelia as our carrier? Actually, this nanomycelia is having a size range between 10 to 100 nanometer. And uh, due to the small particle size, it can easily escape from macrophage engulfment mechanism. Thereby, we can prolong the blood circulation time of the drug. And also, it, ha it, it can uh, accommodate a large amount of hydrophobic drug inside its carrier, in, in, inside its hydrophobic core. And also, it, it possesses good entrapment as well as loading efficiency. And it has good stability also. And it is safe for IV administration and only less number of ingredients are needed for the preparation and the method of preparation is very simple and why we selected pluronic f127 uh, another name is poloxamer actually it is a amphiphilic triblock uh, copolymer having uh, two moieties uh, that is hydrophilic as well as hydrophobic moiety and the hydrophilic moiety is polyethylene oxide whereas the hydrophobic moiety is polypropylene oxide and the advantages are this uh, polymer is biodegradable, bi biodegradable non-toxic stable moreover it has pgp flex inhibiting property so we can um, uh, the more amount of drug will reach to the brain and it has um, uh, or it reduces the plasma protein binding thereby the uh, we can improve the or uh, thereby more amount of drug will be available in, in the uh, blood and it is this polymer is safe for iv administration and it is a fda approved one then these are the some uh, previous reported uh, papers of uh, pluronic based nanomycelia and the key observations are uh, 
this uh, polymer showed or this pluronic based nanomycelia showed higher drug permeation and accumulation rate and is a, it is an effective carrier for localized effect with good safety profile and uh, it showed high entrapment efficiency and improved efficacy also but uh, this while this while this uh, pluronic based nanomycelia has many advantages uh, a combination of uh, phenytoin and uh, this pluronic nanomycelia has not been previously studied so our plan is to or our aim is to uh, our aim was to develop a pluronic based nanomycelia of uh, phenytoin uh, and to determine whether this uh, formulation could reduce the administration and pharmacokinetic issue associated with the conventional phenytoin sodium iv and the research strategy uh, first uh, we have prepared this formulation by thin film hydration method followed by uh, several characterization studies like determining particle size by dls and zeta potential tem ftir ftir etc then followed by uh, several in vitro studies like drug release study blood compatibility study parallel artificial membrane permeability assay plasma protein binding cytocompatibility assay then um, finally in, uh, in vivo studies like acute toxicity study pharmacokinetic biodistribution study and efficacy study so i am going to uh, share a few important uh, data from my work uh, the particle size of our prepared formulation was found to be uh, 20 near 20 nanometer and the uh, entrapment efficiency was uh, 96 percentage whereas the loading efficiency was uh, near 49 percentage and the TEM image showed that all the particles are spherical in shape and are uniformly dispersed in the solution. Then uh, we have performed the in vitro drug release study of our formulation uh, by cellophane barrier membrane method uh, in both phosphate buffer solution as well as blood plasma up to a period of 60 minutes. And the results showed that a complete drug release of 100 percentage was achieved within 25 minutes in case of uh, phosphate buffer solution and within 30 minutes in blood plasma. And the reason is this drug is just physically uh, entrapped inside this uh, micellar core. That's the reason of the fast drug release. And this fast drug release is beneficial for the treatment of seizure emergencies. Then uh, since this is an IV formulation, we have checked the compatibility of a prepared formulation. Uh, with blood components, and um, we have performed uh, the hemolysis assay, PT, APTT assay, blood miscibility assay, and um, this is a, a result of uh, a result of hemolysis assay. And uh, for the study, we have selected different uh, concentration of our uh, prepared formulation, and um, uh, the positive control was triton, and the negative control was a normal saline solution. And the result showed that all the values are within the limit, that is below five percentage, that is a recommended value. Uh, then uh, the uh, and uh, hence we can confirm that our uh, our formulation doesn't induce any hemolysis and hence say for IV administration. Also, we have checked the compatibility of a prepared formulation with uh, cells uh, like a human brain capillary endothelial cells and L929 mouse fibroblast cell. The results showed that more than 90 percentage of cells were viable after 24 hours of incubation with these cells, hence say for IV administration. Uh, then uh, also we have determined the permeability of a prepared formulation through brain lipids in vitro by uh, palm assay that is parallel artificial membrane permeability assay it is an in vitro uh, model for assessing the uh, passive transcellular permeability uh, then here uh, the research showed that the amount of drug permeated through brain lipids by our formulation that is psnm was uh, uh, was high compared to other two groups that is marketed uh, phenytoin sodium iv and control drug solution and this could be due to the presence of pluronic F127 present in the formulation, which could, which, uh, which decrease the uh, interfacial tension between uh, or interfacial tension as well as uh, fluidizes and loosens the intercellular lipid layer. So hence we can say that our formulation could uh, upgrade concentration faster or it, uh, thereby improving the therapeutic outcome. Then uh, uh, we have performed the plasma protein binding assay by SDS gel electrophoresis. Here the band intensity, that is that red color indicates a band intensity. The band intensity produced by our formulation after incubating with plasma for a time period of 5 minutes and 15 minutes was uh, less compared to the marketed formulation control drug solution. And uh, the reason is uh, uh, the hydrophilic moiety, that is polyethylene oxide moiety present in the pluronic uh, is compatible with the blood components and it will block the substance site. In and uh, even after 62 percentage of drug is released, the interaction with the plasma protein was less. And uh, uh, this could be due to the um, uh, this polyethylene that is pluronic surrounding the drug particle, which uh, reduces the interaction with plasma protein. Hence, so we can say that uh, it could be possibly uh, or uh, by lowering this plasma protein uh, binding, uh, we can improve the uh, or we can uh, uh, overcome 
uh, the pharmacokinetic issue associated with the conventional formulation. Then uh, coming to the in vivo study, that is first it is toxicity study, in vivo acute toxicity study. Uh, for this, for doing this study, we obtained several uh, female starlets from uh, central animal lab facility. So this uh, study was conducted as a limit test with a single dose of 25 mg per kg. That is a maximum effective dose of phenytoin and uh, rats corresponding to a human dose of 15 to 20 mg per kg. So according to this uh, limit test, uh, the period of study was 14 days. So at the, in the, First day itself, we have noted the body weight as well as the glucose level of the animal. So on the and during the study period, we have monitored the uh, signs of uh, any toxicity in, in the animal. And on the fifteenth uh, day, again we have noted the body weight as well as glucose level and collected the blood for doing uh, for determining hematological and biochemical parameters. And after that, we have euthanized that animal and collected the organs for necropsical examination. So this uh, data that is uh, the histopathological. Uh, data showed that all the organs are free from any gross pathological changes as well as all the parameters that is hematological as well as biochemical parameters uh, were within the limit. Hence, we can confirm that our formulation is uh, safe for IV administration. Then moving to the biodistribution as well as pharmacokinetic study for prepared formulation. So for this st uh, study, we have obtained 110 uh, male Vista rats of weight 200 to 250 grams. And um, we group these animals into uh, four, that is first with vehicle, then with our formulation, then marketed phenytoin, so sodium, IV, and controlled drug solution. The dose, selected dose was 25 mg per kg, and the uh, time intervals of euthanasia was from 5 minutes to 60 minutes. And we have evaluated the uh, drug concentration, plasma, CSF, brain, and other peripheral organs. So first, we have compared the drug concentration in brain after the administration of PSNM, marketed formulation and control drug solution. And it was found that the drug concentration in brain after the administration of PSNM was significantly high compared to other two groups. And the, uh, the maximum concentration of 865 microgram was achieved within 50 minutes of administration in case of PSNM, whereas in case of marketed formulation control drug solution, the maximum concentration was achieved only at the end of 30 minutes. And uh, in case of PSNM, we can see that this concentration, almost uh, this, uh, this concentration is maintained up to a period of 60 minutes. So uh, this could be due to the uh, PGP, uh, flex inhibiting property of pluronic F127 present in the formulation. Thereby, we can say that our formulation uh, could improve the drug concentration brain, thereby providing better therapeutic outcome. So similar to brain drug concentration here, in case of CSF also, the drug concentration in uh, CSF after the administration of PSNM was significantly high compared to other two groups. And the maximum concentration was achieved at the 15th minute of administration in case of PSNM, whereas in case of marketed formulation controlled drug solution, uh, this uh, maximum concentration was achieved only at the end of 30 minutes. And uh, also we have determined the drug deposition in liver uh, and uh, the this drug uh, drug concentration uh, in liver after the administration of PSNM was significantly low compared to other two groups. And uh, it is re the reason is it is reported that this pluronic reduces the liver uptake of drug. So uh, we can say that our formulation could possibly reduce the liver toxicity. So the, here, uh, similar to the liver uh, drug or liver deposition study, we also determined the drug deposition in other organs like kidney, pancreas, lungs, heart, et cetera, all showed similar results. Then finally, the uh, efficacy of our prepared formulation, that is in vivo anticonvulsant activity of our prepared formulation. For this uh, study, we have utilized 54 uh, male Vista rats. And the model which we have selected was uh, maximum electroshock rat seizure model, which is a um, well-established model for preliminary testing of an, uh, anti epileptic drugs, which are active against generalized tonic-clonic seizure. And, uh, here we have evaluated uh, the tonic in limb extension flexion ratio and maximum protection time. So before going to the results, uh, we can see the five phases of MES conversion that is tonic flexion, tonic extension, clonus, tuper, recovery or death. So this MES uh, tonic means there will be a sudden uh, or stiffness in the uh, legs and arms. And this phase begins with the flexion. In this flexion of uh, trunk followed by abduction and elevation of elbows. And uh, the second phase is extension phase. In th there will be extension of arms and legs. And in case of clonus phase, there will be sudden jerking movements uh, of uh, jerking movements in the legs or arms at, uh, at either one side of the body or both these sides. And uh, the stupor, uh, stupor phase is the uh, state of near unconsciousness. And finally, it is recovery or either death. 
then uh, coming to the result in case of uh, our formulation formulation of lower dose 10 mg per kg and uh, the our, so before that one thing uh, so in this five phase in this five phases more more duration is for extension phase so any agent which reduce or abolish this phase is considered as anti convulsant activity and the time required to abolish this phase is considered as maximum protection time so according to that uh, our formulation of lower dose 10 mg per kg and uh, 25 mg per kg uh, reduce this extension phase extraction where whereas in case of our marketed formulation of dose 25 mg per kg failed to provide substantial protection at the 15th minute of administration and it showed anti convulsant activity only at the 30th minute of administration then in case of phosphinetoin control drug solution as well as uh, psnm of dose 5 mg per kg they uh, they also failed to uh, provide substantial protection at the 15th minute of administration so we confirm that our formulation of lower dose 10 mg per kg is um, beneficial for the treatment of seizure emergency in terms of dose reduction as well as bioavailability so moving to the conclusion part we have prepared this formulation by thin film hydration method and uh, the obtained particle size was uh, near uh, 20 nanometer and in vitro uh, studies uh, proved that this uh, this uh, we have, or we have optimized this formulation through in vitro several in vitro studies and the uh, uh, in vivo in vivo studies proved that uh, this formulation uh, is very beneficial for the treatment of seizure emergency in terms of dose reduction and bioavailability so our uh, work work has published in journal of nanoparticle research in 2022 so these are the details of other publications and conferences attended and i secured second prize in oral presentation in one day national symposium which was held on 7th december 2022 at naipur guwahati and um, i would like to thank dst nano mission for providing the fund for doing this work and also uh, i am thankful to amrita vishwavidya pedam for providing the infrastructure for doing this work so thank you thank you thank you so much ma'am for your informative session so to give away the token of appreciation once again i invite dr sabita ma'am ma'am please okay uh, as uh, this is the last session and the late evening i i, I know it's difficult to get questions but then if there are any questions that participants have please share in the chat box or you can ask directly and if there are no questions i think we can conclude thank you vrinda for explaining the work in a very, uh, very uh, for explaining it in a very fast and clear manner it was uh, very clear and crisp presentation so i thank, uh, thank vrinda for the wonderful presentation and on behalf of ipa i would like to present the certificate of appreciation to dr vrinda and thank i you. wish her thank all you. the all the best and uh, successful research in the future thank you thank, thank you. you thank you okay uh, so all the participants will be given the e certificate once the google form appearing in the chat box is filled in now the google form is uh, in the chat box so you can fill the form and you can get your e certificate thank you So now I would like to invite Dr. Arun Rashid, Professor of Pharmaceutics, Al Shifa College of Pharmacy, Malappuram, for delivering the vote of thanks. Sir, please. A, a warm good evening to one and all. Is it audible, ma'am? Yeah, yeah. Uh, a warm good evening to one and all. I feel privileged and honored to to propose vote of thanks on National Science Day, twenty twenty three. with the theme global science for global well being organized by education division indian pharmaceutical association kerala state branch first and foremost i extend my heartfelt gratitude to dr p j shagar president indian pharmaceutical association kerala state branch who extended the presidential address and the man who behind the organizing this program on behalf of all members of ipa and on my behalf thank you thank you very much sir i ex <coughs> express my profuse thanks to dr john joseph honorable secretary ipa kerala state branch who have extended the welcome address we are blessed with your presence in on this occasion sir on behalf of entire ipa team and my own behalf thank you very much sir we are extremely grateful to dr k krishna kumar chairman education division ipa kerala branch for gracing this occasion with his presence and introduction of chief guest 
on behalf of all assembly here and entire ipa team thank you thank you very much sir i express my sincere thanks to padma bhushan professor p belram former director indian institute of science bangalore for inauguration and keynote address on reflection on science in the age of corona virus on behalf of ipa kerala state branch and my own behalf thank you thank you so much sir spending with us your valuable time my profound profound thanks to our honorable guest dr ajay dipillai scientist head project management national center for cell sciences pune for taking this time to speak out about a successful career in science on behalf of entire ipa team and my own behalf thank you sir thank you very much i want to express my gratitude to the two young researchers and scientists dr chandran nar from naipur ibere and dr brinda s kumar from amrita vishwavidyalayam kochi for giving a in depth insights of some of the most recent advancement in the pharmacy domain thank you thank you very much i would like to thank dr mohammad hanifa principal maulana college of pharmacy pendalmanna dr agash maradagam professor and head department of pharmaceutical chemistry national college of pharmacy and dr sabida m principal amrita school of pharmacy amrita vishwavidyalayam kochi for chairing the respective session and your inputs last but not least i want to thank everyone who helped to make this webinar possible especially the organizing team and my fellow program coordinators dr bobby john ji and uh, uh sabidayam and dr david paul from st james college of pharmacy chalakudi finally i convey my sincere thanks to all distinguished participation participants who showed the willingness for attending this program a short notice this reflects their commitment to our profession we hope all this course will provide a platform for us to gain knowledge and share, share your expertise leading a definite goal for our profession on behalf of ipa and my on behalf of thank you thank you ananda thank you thank you so much sir thank you so here we come to the end of the session all the sessions were very informative inspiring and interesting thank you so much ipa kerala state branch for organizing such a webinar on this very special date hope that all the participants are now enriched with new knowledge and ideas and in future we can see more and more researchers with new innovations thank you all for your kind presence and cooperation and making this program a grand success so now let us stand for the national anthem जन गण मन अधिनायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विधाता पंजाब सिंध गुजरात मराठा द्राविड उत्कल बंगा बिंद हिमाचल यमुना गंगा उच्चल जल धितरंगा तव शुभ नामे जागे तव शुभ आशीष मागे गाहे तव जय गाथा जन गण मंगल दायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विधाता जय हे जय हे जय हे जय जय हे सो थैंक यू सो मच ऑल ऑफ यू फॉर ज्वाइनिंग इन दिस वेबिनार थैंक यू हैव अ नाइस डे